definition of sigma? Okay, yeah, so sigma is a sort of a key concept in the, in the whole idea of how you capture the concept of how extraordinary a result is. Um, so sigma is the sort of shorthand uh, for um, the concept of uh, standard deviation, and, and that, uh, roughly speaking, is a measure of how extraordinary a new finding is. Uh, it measures, in a sense, the sort of distance between the average and where this result is. And so uh, the bigger the sigma value, the more extraordinary uh, the result is compared to uh, what you were expecting. So if you were expecting just random chance, for example, which is the uh, traditional assumption, um, the greater the sigma value, uh, the, the more uh, confidence scientists typically have that the result isn't a fluke. Uh, but uh, that's one of the problems with uh, sigma, uh, as it's normally used by many scientists, is that you have to be very careful that you don't uh, start to misinterpret it, because that's when things can go wrong. And why do you think there's confusion when the media reports on concepts such as two sigma and five sigma compared with the standard interpretation of these sigma levels? Yes, yeah, so um, it's not just the media, I have to say, you know, it's also uh, a lot of working scientists. And, and these numbers of two sigma and five sigma have been in the news a lot recently, uh, actually, because of um, all the fuss there's been in the world of particle physics over the um, putative discovery of this particle called the Higgs boson, um, and basically uh, two sigma is the, if you like, level of um, extraordinariness that uh, most scientists are willing to take as evidence for having discovered something, quote, significant, unquote. This is a sort of standard uh, rule of thumb that's been used for many, many decades. Now, um, it's routinely misinterpreted two sigma uh, in terms of the probability of uh, you um, having got the result uh, by chance alone. So people routinely say that if you've got a result that's two sigma, then that means that roughly speaking, uh, there's a less than 5% chance that the result can be a fluke. And in fact, it doesn't actually mean that. What it actually means is assuming that fluke was the real cause of whatever you saw, then there's only a 5% chance of seeing uh, a result at least as extraordinary as the one you've actually observed. Now, of course, that, that sounds quite similar to what most uh, uh, scientists and many people in the media believe sigma is, but it's not quite the same as the probability that chance really was the explanation for your finding, because Sigma is always based on an assumption, in this case, an assumption that your result was uh, um, the result of chance. But you can't simultaneously then just flip it round to the sigma value and then use it to put a figure on what the probability that your assumption is actually right was. You can't, you can't do both at the same time. And for most scientists, they don't get very excited about this discrepancy. But very interestingly, in particle physics, um, particle physicists have never been comfortable with using the standard two sigma standard for whether they've discovered something important or not. They've always insisted on going all the way to five sigma, which uh, is a much greater level of uh, 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 difference from uh, what you expect by chance alone. Uh, in fact, compared to 5%, a 5 sigma uh, probability is uh, over well, uh, a million times lower um, in terms of the probability that, uh, 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 of getting that result by fluke alone. So now it's interesting to talk about a little bit about why particle physicists have done that, because there's a lesson here for other scientists who uh, stick to the normal criterion of just two sigma. And that is that particle physicists over the decades have um, seen lots of two sigma, even three sigma uh, levels of evidence and thought, oh, well, there must be something in this because you know, this, is the, uh, this is the standard level at which scientists are supposed to get excited about seeing something. But they have seen so many of these results go, like you would expect about 
if it's a 5% probability uh, for two sigma, you'd expect that one in 20 of these results to actually turn out to be a fluke if the standard faulty uh, understanding of sigma was correct. But in fact, particle physicists have seen far, far more than that. So they have come up with a rule of thumb of wanting five sigma, this far, far higher level of, uh, of evidence. And that has a lesson um, for uh, scientists outside of particle physics, especially in medicine, uh, that uh, be very careful about putting too much trust in results that meet this two sigma uh, level of, uh, uh, of uh, significance, because um, there's a, a much higher probability than you think that you're being fooled. So is this why you think it's worrying that scientists regard two sigma level of evidence as representing a publishable result? Yes, yes, that's right, precisely so. Because, um, and uh, this is something that uh, Bayes' theorem makes clear, because Bayes provides you with the machinery from turning the sigma value that you calculate from the data you actually obtained and turn it into the answer to the question you're actually interested in, which is what is the probability that your result really is just a fluke? Now, a lot of people think sigma gives you that directly, but in fact, Bayes' theorem shows that that's not true, and moreover provides you with the mathematical machinery to give you the answer to the question that you want. And in medicine, why would you expect the failure rate in replicating results in clinical data to be higher? And what impact does this have on the credibility of clinical evidence? Yes, well, um, the reason for that uh, is that Bayes' theorem shows you that to convert the sigma value that you calculate from your raw data into the answer to the question you're interested in, namely, what are the chances that the result uh, uh, um, uh, that we've obtained is just a fluke. To bring about that uh, conversion, you need to take into account what's called the prior. This is the um, level of uh, previous evidence uh, that, uh, there was so that there might be something in this hypothesis that you're investigating, namely that this drug might work. So for example, if you're testing out a drug that uh, is just a bit of a me too prod, uh, product that uh, lots of people have evidence on before. Um, there's quite a strong prior belief that, um, that this drug that you're testing now will actually work. On the other hand, if you're uh, involved in uh, some groundbreaking research where there's very little evidence, uh, prior evidence, then you need to alter uh, uh, Bayes' theorem um, the, the prior that you put into that, and that changes the amount of evidence that you need from your clinical trial to produce a really impressive result. And that makes sense. That's, that's perfectly in line with the old scientific adage that uh, extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. Bayes' theorem actually captures that by saying, well, if there's not a lot of evidence for this, or indeed if there's, if there's a lot of skepticism about this particular ph uh, pharmacological uh, mechanism, for example, then you're going to need a lot of evidence to overwhelm that. And Bayes' theorem allows you to combine what you already know with the, uh, from past experience with what you now know from the data from the clinical trial, for example, to, pr uh, to give you the answer to the question, is there something in this drug or not? And in pharmacology, of course, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, variability in just how confident you can be from the prior evidence that you might be onto something uh, um, with uh, a, new, a new drug that you're testing. So you do have to take that into account, and that can change radically uh, uh, with the type of drug that you're um, investigating. And what can be done to put right the misconception of significance? Well, quite, quite simply, um, there needs to be much more stress on two things. Firstly, that uh, what's called significance testing, with its reliance on using sigma just raw from the data, is not the answer to the question you're actually interested in. And secondly, there needs to be emphasis on the fact that the machinery to bring about the conversion of your raw sigma value 
into the answers to the questions you're interested in is available, and it's called Bayes' theorem. Now, the, the problem, uh, you know, if you talk to people who know a little bit about Bayes, they will uh, uh, instantly uh, raise the, 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 the controversy that's always dogged the use of Bayes' theorem, which is this, this use of, of, of prior evidence. Uh, and over the last um, uh, few years, I've been working on methods to try and solve this problem of how can you make sure that, for example, your prior evidence isn't ludicrously optimistic or is based on um, selective data, all those sort of uh, issues are, are the things I'm actually interested in so that more people can use Bayes and can use it very simply with an you know, online calculator or even a, a, um, a graph. Uh, that you could read the values off for a particular clinical result. So that really is how you think we should change our approach to assessing evidence to ensure that it's more credible? Yes, I do. I think that that is the way. Because um, if we don't do it that way, we open ourselves up to uh, potentially a lot of shocks. And um, I mean, to give you a, a, an example, um, uh, some years ago, um, in the 1990s, early 1990s, um, there was a, uh, a study carried out into a clock buster uh, drug called anistreplase. And what this study uh, did was to see if there was a benefit from giving this clock buster drug um, as soon as the, the patient uh, who'd had uh, the uh, potential uh, incident had um, uh, as soon as medics were there, or, you, um, or whether there was a benefit, uh, um, whether you could get away with waiting for half an hour or so uh, until they were in uh, a hospital where, it could, uh, where the drug could be ab administered. And uh, a study of about uh, several hundred people was carried out. And uh, the results of, uh, of this study suggested that the impact of giving it early, as soon as, uh, as, soon as possible, were really dramatic. It produced a 50, 50% uh, percent reduction in mortality. And that, was, that got a lot of headlines, as you can imagine. And a lot of um, uh, cardiologists were very surprised by that. But they said, well, you know, that's what the, that's what the sigma values tell us, so we've got to go along with it. But um, a couple of uh, uh, people, uh, David Spiegelalter, and, uh, and these colleagues uh, did some research um, where they took that trial finding and applied Bayes' theorem to it, taking into account prior insight into how effective clot buster drugs are. And when they um, combined what is already known which suggested a sort of a, a sort of somewhere between not not much benefit to giving it early all the way down to you know say 30 40 percent benefit when they combine that with the evidence from the clinical trial which has created so much fuss because the clinical trial evidence wasn't in fact that strong the prior evidence uh, sort of uh, dragged it back screaming to reality and said that well the real impact yeah there's definitely an advantage to giving it early as you would expect but it's probably closer to about 20% uh, reduction in mortality. And um, about a decade later, a, um, a big meta-analysis, a collection of all the uh, um, evidence uh, on this particular issue was brought together to see, well, how things had panned out once more evidence had come out. And sure enough, that meta-analysis pointed to about a 20 to 25% reduction in mortality. In other words, Bayes had done a very good job in bringing the uh, result of this clinical study into reality uh, and showing that, well, you know, 50% was too much to hope for. In fact, uh, you should expect about 20 to 25%. And that's exactly what we saw. So we already have evidence, and I'm in the process of collecting more evidence, that we need to use uh, Bayes and apply it to pretty much every finding that comes out so that we can assess, well, you know, just how credible is this result? And, and that's uh, what I'm working on uh, right now. Robert, thank you very much for your time today and for your insights. Okay, you're very welcome.